Bona tarda, bones tardes. Comencem. Estem a punt de començar el quart diàleg humanístic on parlarem de les fronteres del segle XXI amb l'escriptor i historiador Matiu Carr i historiador professor de la Facultat d'Humanitats, Antoni Luna. Sisplau, Matiu, Toni. El presidente de Estados Unidos, Donald Trump, solicitará 2.000 millones de dólares en nuevos fondos para la construcción del muro fronterizo en el presupuesto de 2021. Fuente es el periódico de Cataluña ayer 10 de febrero de 2020. La suma fue reportada por primera vez por el diario Wall Street Journal. Hace un año, el gobierno de Trump solicitó al Congreso que proporcionara 5.000 millones de dólares para el muro, además de 3.600 millones de dólares para reponer los recursos que la administración había tomado de proyectos de construcción militar. A mesura que avança la segona dècada del segle XXI, vivim en un món de murs i barreres fortificades que augmenten. Sembla que les fronteres nacionals han adquirit un nou paper en el discurs polític que no estava present ni durant la Guerra Freda. Per què ha passat això? Quins són els factors polítics que impulsen les noves fronteres del segle XXI? Què pretenen assolir aquestes fronteres? En què es diferencien aquestes noves fronteres del segle XXI de les anteriors? Què ens expliquen sobre el nostre present i el nostre possible futur? Tot això són els temes del que avui es parlarà en el diàleg amb el Matthew Carr i Toni Luna, que ara presentaré els dos convidats breument. Matthew Carr ha nascut, va néixer a Londres en 1955, ara ve de Regne Unit per participar en aquest diàleg, així que li agraïm especialment el fet que hagi vingut. Ell va viure aquí durant quasi deu anys. Avui m'explicava, ho explicaré en castellano per que ho entenda millor, que en el seu primer viatge a Espanya no li dejaron entrar per una de les fronteres i el guàrdia li dijo que era perquè tenia el pelo demasiado largo. I llavors se fue por Portbou i allà sí que passó i entró a Espanya fa molts anys. Ell us explicarà algunes d'aquestes experiències. És escritor, periodista, difusor i promotor que ha escrit àmpliament sobre immigració, conflictes, terrorisme, guerra i justícia social. Ha col·laborat en diverses publicacions, entre d'altres, el New York Times, l'Observer i el Guardian. És autor de vuit llibres publicats. La seva no ficció inclou The Infernal Machine, An Alternative History of Terrorism, després Blood and Fate, The Purging of Muslim Spain, després un llibre que està directament relacionat amb el tema d'avui, Fortress Europe, Inside the War on Immigration, l'última edició de 2012 i diversos llibres més que poden consultar a la nostra web. La seva segona novel·la, Black Sun Rising, està ambientada a la Barcelona de 1909 durant la setmana tràgica i la publicarà aquesta primavera amb llengua anglesa Pegasus Books. Antoni Luna, nascut a Barcelona en 1965, és professor d'anàlisi geogràfica regional i coordinador del Grau en Global Studies. És licenciat en Filosofia i Lletres per la Universitat Autònoma de Barcelona. Té un màster en Urban Planning i és doctor en Geografia per la Universitat d'Arizona en l'any 2001. A Barcelona ha impartit classes de màster i de grau per a programes de les universitats de Chicago, Pennsylvania, Georgetown, Duke i altres. Els seus principals temes d'investigació són la geografia cultural i política, els estudis urbans i didàctica de la geografia. És autor de diverses publicacions acadèmiques, monogràfiques, etc. No vull robar més el temps d'aquest diàleg que ara comença. Moltes gràcies a tots i, per favor, Matiu, tienes la palabra como nuestro invitado para empezar este diálogo sobre las fronteras. Thank you, Tamara. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be here, everybody. Thank you.
when I, when I was invited here, I was trying to think, of the, the subject of borders is such a huge subject. It touches on so many different things, human rights, war, conflict, how nations define themselves, how nations exclude people who they think don't belong within their borders and so on. There's a lot of things you can discuss, and I hope we will discuss most of them today. But I thought I'd begin by telling you a couple of personal stories. One is the first time I ever came to Spain. That was in 1975. I was hitchhiking to Spain, and I think I arrived at the frontier of La Jonquera. I, I arrived there, my girlfriend and I were hitchhiking, and we couldn't get into the country because the Guardia Civil wouldn't let us into the country. I, so, I said to the Guardia Civil, look, you know, I'm only here for a few days. Can't we come in? They went, no, your hair is too long. So we'd moved away from that border post to the coastal road, the road that goes to Port Boo. And there, we didn't have any problem. We just walked straight in. So, you know, that was a time, mid-1970s, when borders were not really talked about in political discourse in the so-called free world. When we talked about borders, we talked about the Berlin Wall um, as, as an evil thing. We talked about the Berlin Wall as a barrier that had to come down. We talked about the Iron Curtain and so on. So jump forward to 1995 when I was living in Barcelona and working as a correspondent from time to time for the BBC. In 1995, Spain joined Schengen. It joined the Schengen area formally. And the BBC gave me a job. They said, go to La Jonquera and see if it's possible to cross that border without being stopped. So my job that afternoon was to get in the car and just drive back and forth between La Jonquera and um, France. And I had an interview with the mayor of bourg Madame, the French town right on the frontier. And I remember asking her, how do you feel now there's no border anymore? And she went, frightened. And I said, so I said, why? And she said, because of Africa. <laughs> and I thought that was a strange thing to say. She said, because Africa feels too close to her, she thought. And, uh, you know, we are now in the present, 2020, when there is an actual global obsession, not only with borders, but with militarized borders, with the kind of barriers we see here, fences, walls, police, soldiers. Um, so the question is, I hope we will discuss tonight, is why has that happened? What explains this transformation? similar stories in different borders. I did my dissertation, as I told you this morning, on, um, on the US-Mexico border. And I was crossing every single day with my car to interview people on the Mexican side. And every time, the Mexicans used to have, um, I don't know if they still have, they used to have a traffic light with red and green. And you have to push a button and randomly, if you got red, you got ch uh, check the card and everything. And if you get green, you can pass. And probably of over 100 times across that time, I got 95 times red. Uh, obviously, it was a young man driving alone in a suspicious empty car with only my papers and my pens and, and not even a computer because I didn't have any. So that was the story in that time. So that's one thing. On the other side, a very similar to your story on the border, now I take my students sometimes to France to visit basically some of the areas that were involved in the Spanish refugees uh, going to, you know, a Spanish Republican crossing to France and so on. And now for me, it's still ex weird experience to crossing the border and nobody's asking anything. So that we have these two different situations that are quite different in one place to another. Because I remember crossing that French border and it was not that easy. You were always suspicious that we're trying to do something illegal or some, especially if you're young. Yeah, but I mean, that's one of the interesting things about borders is that they can seem to be permanent for a long period of time. And people assume that such and such a barrier could be the Pyrenean border or the US-Mexico border is there forever. And people imagine that it's always been there. But in fact, a lot of these barriers are actually quite new and quite temporary and can suddenly change. I mean, 
you talk about going to the Pyrenees. I remember the story of Walter Benjamin, mm -hmm. the philosopher and writer Walter Benjamin, when he had his tragic journey to try and escape through, um, through Spain in 1940. What happened with Walter Benjamin was he, he knew that he could not cross the Pyrenees very easily walking because he was in his middle ages, he was a smoker. He was only used to kind of walking around Paris. So he calculated that he would stop every 10 yards while walking, every 10 minutes while walking across the Pyrenees. And if he hadn't had a heart attack, he would continue. And he also took with him morphine tablets because he told Arthur Kersler, if I don't make it, I'm going to kill myself. And what happened was, it's a long story and I'll keep it short, he arrived, you probably know this story, some of you know this story, that he arrived in Port Bell. And the Spanish um, customs guard said, look, you haven't got an exit visa, so you have to go back to France. Um, so for him, to go back to France meant to go back on a train that would take him to Auschwitz in the end or someplace like that. So in the night, he killed himself with those morphine tablets. And the next morning, the Spanish um, customs guard said, OK, the rest of your party can continue. So what you have there is a situation which a border that has disappeared now, we cross it all the time for our holidays back and forth without even thinking about it, was once a frontier between life and death mm -hmm. for some people. Uh, if you didn't have the right papers, you could be killed or sent back to your death. And the Pyrenees has played that role for a long, long time. You know, for hundreds of years, the Pyrenees has been that kind of border. So it's amazing now, like when you walk, when you drive or walk through it, it's just not there, as if it never existed. And then we go out, we find the rest of the world, 65 states in the last 15 years have fortified their borders with fences, new barriers, soldiers, police, and so on. So I guess the thing is, why? What explains that? What, ex what explains this global obsession with walls frontier and militarized frontiers? The other thing that's very interesting is that borders used to be built by non-democratic countries do not to allow the people to let, to not allowing the people to leave the country. Yeah, yeah. To keep it inside. Now it's democratic countries are building the borders to not allowing the others to get in. So it's yeah. a different type of uh, conception of the border. But on the other side, we know that the idea is, I think they have a physicality. There is a physical wall or a physical fence or a physical thing, but it's more like a, an icon, a symbol of protection more than anything, because the truth is but that- But what's, what's it protecting, do you think? Well, they are trying to protect the from getting criminals, non-desirable people, and so on. But the truth is all these people, the goods and the bads, got in through other sources. Yeah. The border is not, a lo um, is not a stopping from all these people to get in. So that's the interesting thing. So we created these huge borders, it cost a fortune. There's a lot of people getting um, a lot of money because it's a money-making machine building walls. And, um, but they are not a, a stopping to get all these people in because those people are getting through airports, through other sources they get inside. So that's a very interesting construct. So it's a very symbolic construction of, of walls, especially in the last 20 something years. It is, and I think it's worth putting a little bit of historical context yeah. on that. Like if we go back, um, the first state borders didn't really begin to appear on maps till about the late 16th century, early 17th century. That's when you see maps drawn by people like Matthias Quant, which show um, state borders in Europe for the first time. But they're not state borders the way we think of them now. They were often done in a kind of hazy colored line because the border was debatable. The, the, the words they used to use to describe borders, they often used to use the phrase debatable lands, um, like the Spanish March. So the area known as the Spanish March, which actually reached from in, deep inside Catalonia to the other side no. of the Catalan Pyrenees on the other side. So there never was a really fixed line. That's one thing. And the other thing is, if you wanted to move from one place to another before the 20th century, quite often you didn't need a passport. Um, and if you had a passport, you didn't show it at the frontier, at the border. You went into the country, and then you could be checked by the police, I don't know, in the capital, in the towns you passed through. I mean, in the 17th century, um, Fernández de Navarrete, the um, secretary of uh, Felipe de Segundo, he said, it's a tragedy because the scum of all Europe is coming to Castile right now, he said. He said, the scum of Europe, meaning beggars, thieves, robbers, and Frenchmen. 
all coming to Castile. But the thing is, um, Felipe did not try and stop these people at the Pyrenees. They, were allowed, they came into Spain, and then, if they were in Valencia, some policeman or militiaman might check their papers. So this idea that the border is the line where you have to show if you have the right to enter is actually quite a new concept, historically speaking. Mm -hmm. um, you can really trace it back to, like, um, probably back to the French Revolution, when the French Revolution began checking... The, Fre the French government, after the revolution, began checking people at the frontier. And then, you know, this kind of spread at different speeds throughout the world. Yeah, yeah, and I think actually things started to get even stronger when we got the Cold War after the Second World War. It's the moment the borders started to be a very uh, strong areas and they, they put a lot of money in protecting the, those borders, those walls, and so on. So that's something that happens quite recently. Absolutely, and also going back just before that, um, Stefan Zweig, the, um, mm -hmm. the, the, the Austrian writer, once wrote in his book, um, his last book actually, The World of Yesterday, he wrote nostalgically of uh, the period before World War I when he said it was possible for him to travel right through America, through Latin America, and also to India without a passport. So Stefan Zweig was a middle-class, fairly affluent writer who could do that. Mm -hmm. Not everybody could do that. But nevertheless, it's striking that he said after World War I, there was this big transformation. Because of World War I, Europe began putting up these militarized borders, because everybody was an enemy, of course. And then after the war, you had um, Stalinism, you had the rise of fascism, you had Nazism. So the whole issue of a border became really important because you had regimes in the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany basically saying, you are no longer a citizen, Excellent. and basically making people stateless. Yeah. So you had this huge problem of refugees, what we began to call refugees for the first time. So you then get to World War II, the end of World War II, this massive refugee problem, 10 million people moving back and forth across Europe. So the whole question of refugees was tied up with the stabilization of Europe. And then you have the Cold War. As Churchill said, an iron curtain has fallen across Europe. So we those of us who were in the so-called free world, Spain wasn't in those days, obviously, but those of us who were, we assumed, we were told that borders are an evil thing um, and that one of the things that defined communism as an evil system was the fact that it stopped people moving. Yet now, when communism has long since seen to be any kind of security threat, we have democratic states imposing barriers that are just as dangerous just as lethal and which actually kill people, kill more people. When I say kill, I mean kill because the Berlin Wall, about 135 people died in the whole period of the Cold War trying to cross, the, the, trying to cross that border. Every one of those lives is important. Yet, 34,000 people have died trying to enter Europe in, since 1992. 34,000, probably more now, and nobody even knows that number. Most of them drowned. Some committed suicide in detention centers. So others died in the Sahara Desert trying to cross, trying to reach Europe. What do they have in common, these people? Most of them are black, brown, they're not white. Mm -hmm. And I think when we talk about why these borders have been introduced in the so-called free world, we can't ignore that racial, ethnic dimension. I don't, I don't mean to say that these borders are specifically aimed to kill black and brown people. It just so happens the majority of people who die trying to cross them are not white. Yeah. Well, I suppose it's, it used to be an east-west type of wall, and now it's a north-south type of wall, but it's different. Uh, and, and it's not that different in here in the Europe. Now, well, the world in even in those times of the east-west world, there was a lot of restrictions of the poor countries in the south to cross to the northern countries. It's when Greece, Spain, Portugal, even Italy, or even Yugoslavia were trying to work in Germany. They have a lot of controls because they were poor. Now that border has shifted south, and now it's the Mediterranean, so it's a safer border in that way because it's a, it's a mass of water that will protect us from getting more people getting in. And, and that's interesting when we go even the Ceuta and Melilla, that is a very interesting case because it's our borders on the Moroccan side for Europe. And they didn't exist like a very heavy border before Spain yep. joined the European Union. 
So yeah. it became a very stronghold, a very, a very important uh, wall and very mm, defensive area when Spain entered the Euro European Union because it was one of the requisites before joining the Schengen Treaty. Absolutely right. And I think that's, um, that is part of the contradiction, the paradox of yeah. the European Union and the paradox of Schengen. On one hand, Schengen has brought um, freedom to something like 450 million people who are members of the Schengen Zone, the 26 member countries of the Schengen Zone. It makes it possible, well, in, my, in our case, in my country now, in one year's time, it won't be possible because we've, we're doing things differently, as you probably know. Um, but generally speaking, it made it possible, it took away borders, European borders, that, it, for example, in the time of Walter Benjamin, had been at borders of life and death. Yeah. So that's the softening the, uh, the dismantling of historic frontiers. But that process was accompanied by the hardening of the external borders of the European Union. And that meant that places like Futa and Melia had a new importance that they didn't have before. Yeah. I mean, I remember in Melia, people always commented to me that, oh yeah, before Schengen, there was just a little bit of barbed wire. Anyone could walk around it. It wasn't a problem. You go to Melia now, it's quite astonishing. And when I say now, now in my case actually means a few years back because the last time I was in Malia was about nine, ten years ago. It was bad enough then. Huge fence with all kinds of electronic devices on it. You, go, you cross one fence, and then you find yourself in the middle of this little no-man's land, about, I don't know, about that wide, with these, um, the three-dimensional fence going across here. The point of that is to catch your legs. While it catches your legs, pepper spray sprays in your face. If you manage to get through that and climb higher, you have razor wire, which will cut your hands. If you manage to get across that, the top part of the fence will fold back against you, forcing you down. Yet in 2005, hundreds of um, African migrants who had been trapped outside that fence for months tried to cross it. And at least 13 of them were killed trying to cross it. No one knows why they were killed or who killed them, because this is another contradiction of the Malia border. The Malia border, the actual fence, the electric fence, is built inside Spanish territory. So that should mean that the territory outside the fence is also Spanish. So that should mean if you find a dead body in that place, then it's Spanish responsibility. But in fact, it doesn't work like that. What actually happens is when bodies turn up dead outside that fence, which they do quite often, the Morocco says, ah, oh, it's the Spanish fault. And the Spain just says, ah, oh, it's the Moroccans that did it. Yeah. And that's what happened in 2005. They had two investigations in Morocco and in Spain into those dead migrants. Morocco said, ah, Spain did it. And Spain said, Morocco did it. So who did it? Nobody knows who did it. And this is one of the disastrous consequences of this new border system. It creates these spaces where the people who enter them literally have no rights. Their rights disappear. And it's no longer clear who is responsible for enforcing yeah. their rights. Yeah. It creates a kind of lethal ambiguity. Um, and it's, um, you know, when you speak to people who've gone through it, when you see how this is done, it's quite horrifying to actually see it. The other thing that's very interesting, uh, and that's something I experienced in Mexico, but also here, is the, the creation of all these border culture, these people that live there in a very particular way. In, Me in Ceuta and Melilla, we have all these people carrying all these huge bags, yep. smuggling things in and out. Yep. Uh, the same thing happens in Mexico. They have all these people crossing back and forth. The economy on both sides depends very much on, on, on having a fence in the middle. I, was, uh, I remember one of the things, the most shocking things in the US-Mexico border, for example, in the American side, there's huge uh, residential areas for elderly people coming from uh, Canada or the northern states of the United States, the cold states, they call it the, the snowbirds because they just came there during the uh, winter season and then they went back to their houses in the northern part of the United States or Canada during the summer because that area is very hot. The reason why they moved there is because they cross across the border, because it's not a very beautiful place to live, because they cross across the border to buy prescriptions from the pharmacies in the, um, the Mexican side, because they are way cheaper than they are in, uh, in the United States. 
and they can buy it without any prescription. So you have, if you cross any US-Mexico uh, border and you get into the Mexican side, you get a lot of uh, bars and restaurants and liquor shops and stuff like that, but there's a lot of pharmacies that you can buy every, anything you want. Mm -hmm. So it's a, they create these microcosms, these different uh, situations in the people are moving back and forth doing different things. In Ceuta or Melilla, we got all these buses of ladies, middle-aged ladies, crossing to the other side just to work as a maid in somebody's houses. Yeah. And then they go back to their houses in the, in the, at night. So they cross back and forth. And sometimes they work for four hours, but they have to spend one or a half hour each way to cross the border. So basically, well, I don't know how much they make, but they suppose very little but they have to count how much time they take them, how much uh, time they use to get to their job. Place. It's interesting you mentioned both those borders together because um, some political scientists call Futa and Melia the um, Europe's Rio Grande yeah. because that's what it is. And I remember one time I was in Melia watching that happen and it's really a shocking sight actually. If you want to see how a border confirms the differences in lifestyle, in wages, in expectation between one country after another, you go to Melia, you see these women, um, they call it um, the comercio atipico mm -hmm. in future Melia, which basically means legalized, legalized smuggling is what it is. Um, but it's, yeah. it's permitted there, so it's, it's not legal, but it's not illegal. That's, um, and so what happens is these women, they take things like um, nappies, cosmetics and so on, carry these huge bundles, I mean like, I'm talking about this kind of height, and they carry them through special tunnels created just for them. And so you watch that happen. You see the civil guard shouting at them, occasionally hitting them, poking them with sticks to make them go faster. It's quite horrific. It's like something out of uh, Mad Max, yeah. um, Barter Town, you know. Yeah, these huge things, yeah. I think that's another thing worth bearing in mind is that when we talk about these, this new political, cultural obsession with borders, there are certain differences. This, one is the fact that um, in the 1990s, the more utopian kind of um, proponents of um, globalization said that we have now entered a borderless world. And they said the Berlin Wall is gone and in the future there won't be barriers like that because now we will have free movement of goods, capital, information, data, and so on. We'll cross borders easily and those old kind of um, ideological, political barriers will disappear. What is striking is that that didn't happen and yet it also did happen, because once again, the paradox of the European Union, dozens of borders disappeared. You have this huge and in many ways very successful experiment in shared sovereignty. Um, and at the same time, you have these viciously exclusionary borders surrounding the whole continent, in which countries like Spain, Greece, Italy, Malta, have all been given the responsibility of being customs and frontier guards for Northern Europe, essentially. And this, in, in countries like Greece, this has had catastrophic consequences because you have thousands of people trying to enter Greece, not because they want to be in Greece, because they want to go somewhere else, but they can't go anywhere else because the European Union, well, because Italy has established a new border. It's not a Schengen border. It's its own private border for migrants. So one time I went to this town called Igomenitsa, which is at the top of this highway that leads down to, or it's where you can get ships to go to Italy. There I found something like 400 people living in the hills around there in little shelters made of plastic and so on. Every one of them trying to leave Greece. Mm -hmm. So what has this done in Greece? One thing it's done is it's actually increased, the pos it's increased racism inside Greece because you have Greece, a country that has been subjected to um, quite brutal austerity measures um, as a result of the financial crisis. You have a population that sees migrants coming into the country all the time who can't get out. Yeah. So they're stuck there. They don't want to be there. The Greeks don't want them to be there. And so you have terrible possibility for the rise of far-right parties like Golden Dawn. And, you know, sometimes Spain, Spain doesn't behave like Greece, but Spain has sometimes done this kind of thing. I mean, I, I've met people in Melilla, for example, migrants, who were given permission by the Spanish police to leave Melilla and come to Spain. So they're given these yellow cards. So they get on the boat, they arrive in Spain on the mainland, 
I mean, in theory, they're in Spain. If they're in Melilla, they're in Spain, politically, but not in practice. So what happens is Melilla and Fiuta act like little um, detention centers. Yeah. And you find people living there who've basically been living there for five years. They can't work. They can't get nationality. They can't get permission to work. Finally, the Melilla or the Fiuta police say, OK, you can go to mainland Spain now. You get a temporary visa with a yellow card. So they arrive in mainland Spain, and the police go, no, no, you can't. Go back to Melilla. Incredible situations. You know, and they're, they're routine consequences of this new um, frontier world that we now inhabit. Yes, there's another thing that for me is really striking. There's at the landscape of borders in Europe, for example. There are cities that, for example, the border between Germany and Poland for years was a really strong border. Absolutely. It was very difficult to cross from one side to the other. Now that place has disappeared. So the, one of the things is there is some artists working on the abandoned custom houses all over Europe because there are custom houses all over the place that they're no longer in use because they are the old borders and nobody used them. So sometimes they are full of graffiti and stuff. So there are people taking pictures of that decay uh, political borders. But on the other side, the border between Poland and Belarus now is a strong border. Yeah. And it used to be a very weak border before. Mm. So this thing that it's changing borders all the time, yeah. uh, creating new, so they need to build all those things that we are abandoned in one side, they have to be built somewhere else. So that's a very interesting process in that. Absolutely, yeah. Now, the, the Polish border is particularly interesting as well because the Polish border is where the final solution was implemented. Yeah. Um, it was where it was designed in Lublin um, with Operation Reinhardt and so on, and that's where it was put into practice in the first, the first um, actual killing camps as opposed to detention camps were all along that Polish border. And in fact, in terms of like ethnic violence during World War II, you could call that whole area, that whole re area running down um, the Kresy, as they call it in Poland, the whole border running down the eastern borders of Europe were the most violent borders in the whole of the Second World War. That's where you had kind of um, anti-Semitism practiced not only by the Nazis, but by Romanians, by in Lithuania, in, um, yeah. in Poland, obviously, all over. So it's quite striking that now you see this new attempt to push the, Europe's borders further east. And this is another thing about borders. Even though they seem to be permanent now, they're still debatable. In other words, you know, only um, until about 15 years ago, we didn't think that Poland and Eastern Europe would be part of Europe. There was debate. Are they part of Europe? Are they really Europeans? These kind of debates. Now, nobody questions that. So it's quite possible one day it's possible that Turkey could be a member of the European Union. You could have the borders of the European Union reaching right up to Iraq, something that terrifies the um, far right all over the continent, of course. They're always warning about that. But, you know, it shows that, that, that borders can be lethal barriers, lethal obstacles, and yet at the same time, they can just vanish, as we talked about at the beginning in the case of the Pyrenees. Well, there actually is something else. that it's, uh, Countries like Spain or France or Italy are working beyond Morocco to stop Absolutely. people before yeah. they get into yeah. Morocco, helping the Moroccan uh, army or the Moroccan police to stop the people. And the same thing, Americans are stopping people in Guatemala or in Honduras before they get to Mexico. So it's all this connection. They're getting farther down to stop the people before they get to the real fence of their country. I think that's a very important point because um, India, for example, has built a long, um, almost 2,000 kilometer fence along its border with Bangladesh. And the aim of that border is to stop um, Bangladeshi undocumented migrant workers from crossing and also to stop Muslims from entering India. That's becoming clearer now. Um, Botswana has created a small fence to stop Zimbabwean migrant workers from entering. So lots of countries are doing this, but powerful states like ours have different potential. We can project border power far yeah. beyond our own frontiers. So what you get is a situation in which, in effect, in Spain has done this very well, but so has my own country. What we do is we send officials to certain countries where we think people might want to come, and we stop them. Yeah. We stop them getting on planes. We say, you can't get a visa, you can't do this. Um, and therefore, what we're actually doing by this is we are um, enlisting other countries as our border guards. Particularly clear in the case of Morocco. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'll give you an example of this. In Morocco, I went to the visit the border of, at Oujda, the town of Oujda. 
It's a, not quite a large town, about 500,000 people, right on the border, on the Algerian border. And on the other side of Ujda in Algeria is a town called Magnia. And Magnia is at the end of the um, so-called Trans-Saharan route. So most migrants who've made their way up through sub-Saharan Africa will have crossed mm -hmm. the border to get there. So then they enter Morocco, if they're lucky, if they get past the Algerian border guards. Then if they're in Morocco, the Moroccan police keep them trapped in this little corner around Ujda, where they have no shelter, no one looks after them, no health service, no way of gaining any money. And I met people like literally living in the forest, like forest people. And from time to time, the police come, and they beat them up, chase them, or they take away their shoes and their mobile phones, and they push them across the border into Algeria. What happens in Algeria? The Algerian guards push them back into Morocco. And this goes on and on and on. And who is benefiting from this? The answer is Spain is benefiting from it, and the European Union is benefiting from it, because Morocco is doing this work for Europe, essentially. It's, and it does it in return for money, because we've made it conditional um, to Libya, to Tunisia, to Morocco, and to other countries in Africa, that if you do this work for us, you are likely to get more development aid, and so on. Sometimes it's as clear as that. It's actually almost like a bribe. Well, that's sometimes where I think Schengen has benefited enormously the northern European countries because they don't have to worry about their, their borders anymore. Absolutely, yeah, it does. Because the it border does. problem has gone through the southern European countries that are the ones who have to cope, or the eastern European countries that are the ones who have to stop everyone. And that's happening in the Hungarian-Serbian border, the, the Moroccan-Spain border, and all those borders, or Greece with Turkey. So these areas are becoming the outside borders of Europe, and the rest of the Europeans are fine, because mm -hmm. they don't have to do anything. That is what happens. That is what happens a lot, and um, it's part of the tragedy that we are witnessing, really, that basically richer northern countries in northern Europe are expecting southern Europe to do their work for them as border guards. But I mean, it, the consequences of this can be absolutely catastrophic. You know, like um, now, for example, I'm sure many people here will know that Libya is a state that is an ex a state of extreme conflict and chaos and have not managed to kind of like have a stable government since the fall of Gaddafi. So Libya is a place that was always a difficult place for migrants. So the arrangement we now have, the European Union now has, is when we, our ships, or be they Italian ships or Spanish ships or whatever, find migrants, we push them back, give them to the Libyan Coast Guard, who then take them back into Libya. What happens to them in, Li in Libya, no one knows. But we do hear reports. We know that there are actual slave markets in Libya now, where literally migrants are being bought and sold in old, like in old slave auctions. We know that the detention centers in Libya are some of the worst in the world. So this is a part of the paradox of the European Union again. We, in Schengen, belong to a space of peace, security, and justice. Yet we are creating spaces where none of those things exist. But for it, because we are liberal democratic states, we don't say, OK, this is what happens. We don't care. What we do is we push the whole problem away so that it's unseen and it becomes invisible. So what happens to migrants in Libya, what I was saying before, they become ambiguous zones where who is responsible? No one knows. No one asks. And the result is an ongoing tragedy. And I think. Um, if we're ever going to get out of this, to get to a better place, we need, as citizens and as government, to recognize that this is happening and that we bear some responsibility for it. Um, and I, once again, I say some, because some people say, ah, Europe is deliberately killing these people. For me, that's an exaggeration. What Europe does, and what the United States does, is it forces migrants to make more and more dangerous journeys in which they're likely to be killed or at least experience extreme hardship. And the philosophy behind that is, the harder it gets, the more likely they won't come, which is actually not true in practice, because they still come. Yeah. Well, I think that another thing that's very interesting is when uh, all the discussion about Trump building the new wall and all that stuff, many European countries complain about that policy against the Mexicans, but then nobody realized that we were doing those things in, in Ceuta Medilla before they were doing that in Mexico. And actually, it was a very interesting concept. I, I found out recently that the, the blade wires that were being used 
and now I think they are no longer in use because they are being forbidden in the Ceuta, Morocco, Melilla, Morocco border. It's been built by a Spanish company mm -hmm. that promote that blade, uh, blade uh, wire uh, as a very protective uh, system, a very cheap to establish or to, to, uh, to set it up. And, and now it seems it's been bought by the, that company selling that uh, wire to the people in um, Hungarian, Morocco, Hungarian Serbia border. Mm -hmm. because it's found. So there's all these businesses that are building up things. That's another thing I've, I found fascinating. Who built the Berlin Wall? I suppose it was the army, the German army did it. Now everything is privatized. So yeah. it's we commission, we buy, we, we, we get companies involved. I think they have some pictures here. They show uh, people selling Trump all the models of wall they can get. Like uh, when you buy curtains for your house, you had a catalog with different, so if you have a catalog of walls, you can get this one, this one, or that one. The security guards in many cases are not police, are security guards in many of those things. Uh, so everything is going privatized and is a big business around those things. And it, that's another thing, it's strange and new. Yeah. It didn't exist before. You can see lots of connections like that. I mean, I think that's part, part of the explanation for that is that border enforcement overlaps with law enforcement immigration enforcement, and also security from the point of view of the governments that do it. So if you look at some of the companies like Halliburton, for example, Halliburton was very involved in the Iraq war, um, providing logistics to the American army and so on. Halliburton is also very um, influential in law enforcement, in, in uh, managing prisons inside the United States, and also in managing immigration enforcement, deportations, detention, and so on. So you have this constant overlap, as you say, between in which companies, like in the United States, it might be Boeing or Lockheed Martin. Over here, there's a project called Eurosur, which is a kind of um, long-term research project to create permanent surveillance of all Europeans, Europe's land and maritime borders. The idea is that the Mediterranean and all these borders will be permanently watched, either by um, UAVs or by ships and so on, and, so the, and by robotics. Robotics is a very important element in terms of how borders are being developed for the future. In the ideal future border, there won't be border guards. They'll just be robots. And if you're an illegal, undocumented migrant or whatever, or somebody who doesn't have permission to be there, when you come near to the frontier, some form of robot technology will stop you. Um, in the worst case scenario is that robot technology might shoot you, but it will certainly stop you. So there are lots of companies looking to make money yeah, yeah, out yeah. of that, as is always the case. It's interesting, though, with the, um, you were talking about the U.S. When I was talking about Libya and you were talking about the U.S.-Mexico border, I was thinking it's a very similar process in the United States to what I was describing in Libya, in that since the United States began to reinforce the U.S.-Mexico border in the 1990s, more or less corresponding with the NAFTA, the introduction yeah. of the NAFTA, then what they've done is they've transferred the whole of Mexico into a gauntlet which migrants have to cross. So all the things I was talking about, violence, rape, arbitrary detention, slave markets you find in Libya, you also find them in Mexico. Oh, and Mexico is an incredibly dangerous place to be a migrant. And most of them, of course, as we know, are coming from Central America. Um, so they're fleeing countries that are already countries being overwhelmed by various forms of criminal narco violence. They then have to cross Mexico, and they have to go through the bestia, the train, the famous train, if they're on land, they have every chance of being kidnapped by narco gangs and put into forced labor. Then they get to the border and they find this huge array of defenses waiting for them and a country that, well, especially under Trump, but also under Obama, just wants to push them back, yeah. even kids. I mean, what, one of the most horrific things about under Trump is we've seen border guards taking kids away from their parents and actually permanently separating them. Mm -hmm. you know, and this is the United States, the world's most powerful democracy, doing that, taking kids away from their parents and not allowing them to see their parents again in some cases. And um, Trump would like to go further, of course, as always. There was um, some conversations recor recorded with him speaking to some of his officials in which he said, why can't we just dig a long moat 
running the whole length of the wall and put snakes in it. <laughs> this was the conversation he had with some of his border officials. And they said, Mr. President, we can't do that. And he was going, why not? Why can't we put, why can't we put snakes in a, in a moat? This is the kind of insane thinking that he's doing. So we can laugh at Trump. We can think he's a ridiculous, grotesque yeah. tyrant. But we have to think that these kind of things are already, were already underway under Obama and you know, a part of a long-term process. I remember the person who started to build the wall in the US-Mexico border was uh, Clinton. Yeah, absolutely. He was the one who started to make the bigger fence was Clinton at that time. And actually, it's another interesting thing. The border, the fence in the US-Mexico border is only stopping people from crossing, but not goods. Because the, the Mexicans created, uh, I think it's like something like 20 kilometers free zone on yep. the Mexican side where you can run business of any kind. And that was the success of the whole maquiladora business. Yep. So they can establish maquiladoras with the same rights as, um, uh, they, they, can have, they don't have to pay any taxes in that side because it's considered a free zone. Mm -hmm. So it's quite strange how they created very strong fences for the people but not for the businesses. So that's, that's another very interesting thing. And also, under Clinton, the death toll began to rise yeah. because basically, by, through things like Operation Gatekeeper, when they began strengthening the borders around San Diego and El Paso and places like that, they were forcing migrants to make more dangerous journeys yes, through the through Arizona the desert, desert where they were likely to die. But I guess also, you know, we can talk a lot about the kind of disastrous humanitarian consequences of these borders, but I think a very important thing to bear in mind and consider is why is this happening? Mm -hmm. Um, you know, why are countries doing this now and they weren't doing it before? And um, to me, there are various answers which sort of overlap with each other. I don't know what you think of this. One is that from, to some extent, these frontiers are a reaction to globalization in the sense of governments are prepared to allow the movement of data, capital, investment, and so on, technology, 24-hour production lines, and so on. They want that. They're prepared to allow that. But what is dangerous for them is the movement of people. Um, and then you come into this whole thing, which is that borders, to some extent, are attempts to answer a question. The question is, who are we? Uh, it's the question that the political scientist Samuel Huntington put in a book he wrote with that title, Who Are We? And he argued that the United States was now in danger of becoming no longer a Christian country, no longer a, a, a Protestant country, but becoming a Catholic country and a Spanish-speaking country, mm -hmm. which actually... Um, in terms of Spanish speaking, could be true in about 30 or 40 years because the demographic is changing. To, to some extent, putting these borders up is an attempt to redefine who are we, what, is the, what, is the, what belongs inside these borders and what is not compatible with it. And in Europe, we see the same argument played out. We see a new form of culturalized racism in which we, we don't talk about skin color anymore, we talk about religion or culture and we talk about culture as if it was a permanent thing, like a genetic thing. So we think, um, you know, you hear Victor Orban say, Hungary is a Christian country, and then he presents himself as a defender of Christian Europe. You know, and so, to some extent, borders are part of the response to these kind of politics, primarily driven by the right, and including by the far right, but not only by them, because many mainstream politicians and governments have made the same kind of arguments. To defend who we are as a country, or as a civilization, we need to keep people out. And if they die or get injured in the process, they are collateral damage. Um, and this is kind of how I see what is happening now. And that overlaps with security, the war on terror, um, and various other things. So what do you think of that? Well, I think uh, the, the very interesting thing is that I think everything has started to be stronger. You know, borders became really hard places. And all the policies started to get in the way you're saying after September 11 yeah, uh, in, absolutely. In, um, in, the, in, the, in the United States and with the general fear for terrorism. But the truth is if you chase or you check where these people who commit the terrorist attacks come from, mm, almost none of them cross the border through these border zones. Yeah. You've got the case of the United States uh, airplane attacks where people got into the United States with a student visa. Yeah. Uh, the people who attacked in Paris, I think there were people that just got from other sources. So the truth is, it's a symbol to create Absolutely. this idea that we are protected 
but and we have created a world that is protecting us from all these dangers because it's not only the people but also drugs and weapons and so on. Uh, but the truth is that all those things are getting in through other sources and that's another border that people don't realize exist. That um, uh, free zones on the harbors, for example, these areas are where the containers are. There are areas that nobody can go unless mm. you have a permit. And those areas, nobody checks any of those things. I think from all the containers that got into Spain uh, or into Gibraltar and uh, Algeciras, only about 5% of them are scanned. The rest of them just cross. And inside there, there could be anything, weapons, drugs, any type of food or any type of uh, product, and even people yeah. in some cases. And nobody checks those. Yeah. And then it's like, you are trying to protect something with a fence, and then you have holes everywhere else where things can get inside the country. So in a way, it's a way to, as you said, I think it's a barrier of globalization. We want globalization because it's good for business, but at the same time, we have to say that we are protecting the security of us, of, 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 of all the people that are benefiting from this globalization. Absolutely, so, and it's a, it's a complex problem because it's like borders are the wrong answer to what sometimes is the right question and sometimes is the wrong question. But I mean, the thing is, if we were dictatorships, for example, we would not even be having this conversation. Yeah. Nobody would question no. why are there borders. It's because we are democratic states that we supposedly aspire to a different way of conducting ourselves, not only domestically, but in terms of foreign policy as well. And so this is one of the reasons why this whole process is so striking and so egregious. Because, you know, we see the security argument, for example, Gordon Brown, um, one of our ex-prime ministers in my country, used to say about the Afghan war, our security begins in Afghanistan, he said. So basically, in other words, we're there fighting them to stop them coming here. Mm -hmm. So this kind of discourse is actually quite common. American politicians use the same kind of language. And the idea is that you've got, it's, it's like forward border protection. So you've got your border uh, around your country, and then you've got your army over there also adding another layer of border defense. This is actually quite a kind of um, reductionist, simplistic, and quite often dishonest way of looking the, at the world. And it's certainly a very chaotic um, way of looking at the world. Because this is one of the things is that borders are part of the management of globalization. They're, they're an attempt. Many, most officials that I've ever spoken to, or be they border guards or politicians, none of them have ever told me we want to stop migration completely. What they have said is you want to slow it down and control it. Yeah. So this is the way of, um, it's, you know, and another argument that you often hear, I'm sure everybody here has heard this at some point, is um, the reason we have to act is to stop criminal traffic of people. But the problem is that the traffic of, of people, the movement of people, the smugglers, the people who make money out of it, do this because of the borders. In other words, the borders themselves are creating a huge criminal industry in the movement of people. Mm -hmm. And some of the people, um, some of these people who are, our governments often call them traffickers. They're not traffickers, they're smugglers. It's a different thing. But um, governments often deliberately mix the two words up, trafficker, smuggler, to totally different things. Is that you'll find smugglers who are actually utterly ruthless and really horrific characters, like, you know, the kind who put, say, a hundred migrants in a tiny boat without life jackets, and then they die, and they take their money off them. You'll find people like that. But there are also smugglers who actually think it's a humanitarian thing to do, to move people from one place to another, just like Raoul Wallenbeck did during World War II. There were people who smuggled Jews in and out of countries because they saw it as a humanitarian exercise. So something similar is happening now. And I guess our challenge, really, as citizens of democratic countries is to think of how we can manage the various international global problems that we have in a more humane way in which we actually live up to our own ideals instead of contradicting them again and again through these kind of um, border systems. Yeah, I suppose what we should do, I, I always thought the same way. I remember when Spain joined the European Union or uh, Portugal at the same time, it was a huge concern by, I think it was Luxembourg, that there will be huge flows of Portuguese going to Luxembourg and it's gonna be a big problem. And there were many countries that were saying the same. The truth is after 
those two countries enter the European Union, the flow of people trying to get into the European Union disappear because the increase of the, of the quality of life in the two countries increase and people don't want to leave. If you are good in your country, you don't want to move. Yeah. Uh, the problem is that when countries don't, so I don't know, for me the question is we need to do policies and improve the, the situation in those countries in the, in the south beyond the just making little investments. So I agree, I agree, but there's also, um, there is the theory that um, if we, if we, the idea is that development will stop migration, but development doesn't necessarily stop migration no. because what, what happens is as people's standards of education rise and as their income levels rise, their expectations also rise. Personally, I think we need to find a different way of looking at migration in general, accepting migration as a natural human activity that has been part of human history since human beings first came into the earth. That doesn't mean you don't, need, you don't have to have borders. I don't see anything wrong with a border in itself. What I see wrong is when you're excluding whole categories of people and exposing them to death and danger yeah. as a result of the barriers you impose. You know? And this is what we're doing all the time. So even if we did that, even if we had a more equal world, it's certainly true that you wouldn't get so many Mexicans wanting to cross the United States. After all, the average income in Mexico is about four, three, four thousand dollars in the United States is $34,000. So obviously if you're Mexican and you see that, you would want to cross because you can help your family that way. Um, you can help your family, you can send money back to them, you can use remittances as development. So yes, we would reduce the level of migration, but it would still continue in some form because people will always want to move to some place where they think they can find something better. And, and also because the issue of persecution, war, and conflict is not something that's going to disappear. No. You know, we hope it will. We hope we'd like to create a world in which these things are reduced, but at the moment, we're not looking at that at all. Yeah, um, but I, I'm thinking, for example, that some of the countries, what they want to, really want to do with the borders is to select the people who want to they don't want to stop migration. They want to be able to select which one of them are going to cross and which ones we don't want. Is that, that level of selection. I think it's basically one of the reasons UK is getting out, one of the reasons there is, is they, want to, they don't want all the uh, Schengen people getting there freely. They want to select who they want to get in. It's true, but the United, the, uh, my country, which is, um, a disastrous, from in my opinion, I, this is my opinion, my, you might or might not share it, is a disastrous test case in the uh, calamitous in consequences of populist politics. I mean, when I was young, the UK was always a country that was obsessed with immigration. There were always too many immigrants coming from India, from Pakistan, from the Caribbean. Then we introduced our successive governments, Labour governments and Conservative governments, introduced one law after another, saying you can't come if you're from this part of the country, you can't come from India. We reduced that possibility. So at that time, we more or less had a country dictated by skin colour racism. It was black people we didn't want, or brown people. Now, we found in the last few years, it's just people who don't speak English. Um, so we've, been, you know, we've had the whole Brexit process, the idea that free movement which free movement is actually a privilege that, um, that you know, we, I feel I have lost personally. Free movement is now seen as a form of colonization by Europeans. So you now have situations in the UK in which people are being attacked verbally and physically in the streets for speaking their own language. Imagine if that happened to British here in Spain. You know, it's, it's an ins and, and so what, what I mean by that is that the expectations of who are we are always changing. Yeah. And they're always based on excluding one category of people, be it based on skin color, be they Muslims, be they Polish immigrants, whatever. And what we need to change is the civic, the civic culture of our countries, that we have a more generous idea of what we should be as a country, instead of thinking ourselves in terms of only one thing, one thing, one majority in the first person plural. And until we get there, we will continue to have these kind of barriers with all the consequences they entail. Yeah. I was thinking there is that program that the United States used to have. I don't know if you're familiar Which with it. Which program? The, the Green Lottery. The Green Card Lottery. Mm. Uh, <coughs> if you live in the United States or elsewhere in the world, there is a Green Card Lottery. I think it's no longer working. I, I'm not sure. You can apply. You just send a letter. And if you win, you get the Green Card. 
And then you have to prove that you have a profession or st some studies, some degree. And, and then you have to go through a physical uh, examination if you don't have anything bad. And then you get the green card. So it means that you are entitled to work and live in the United States freely. That when I, if you read it, they give it uh, something like 55 uh, green cards every year, 55,000 mm -hmm. green cards every year. But it's only, I think it's uh, Mexico, right. you get 5,000. Right. The Europeans get over 25,000. Well, there you go. So it's a way to, to select who you want to get in that country. Yeah, that's true. And that's quite an, there's quite an important... Um, that's quite an important subject you've touched on, actually, which is, I remember when I was in Italy, in the town, in the city of Brescia, I think I was there in about 2011, and around that time, there was a protest known as the Crane protest, in which um, about six or seven um, Egyptian and African migrants climbed to the top of a very high crane, and they spent like about two months on top of the crane. So loads of Italians, Italians are very creative, I think, with their protests, they all <laughs> gathered round underneath the the crane in support of those migrants who were on top of the crane. The question is, why were they on the crane? The reason, the Berlusconi government had offered an amnesty for all undocumented migrants in Italy, but he didn't say how many would get it. So what you had was something like uh, maybe six or seven hundred thousand people paying money to access the process, you know, the bureaucratic process to, to get an amnesty and get legalization, only to find that only about 80,000 people actually got it. So these migrants were saying, we've spent all this money to these middlemen who've taken our money, and we don't have much money anyway, and they're not going to give us an amnesty? Yeah. So they climbed the crane. And um, I've seen the same thing in Spain as well. Yeah, yeah. In, it's very, it's very similar. And in my country as well, exactly the same process again and again. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. I just want to ask uh, a few questions. Uh, al final, en modo conclusión, um, hoy estábamos hablando de este tema y, bueno, Tony Luna, que es profesor y, y coordinador de Global Studies, estaba explicando que llevaba a sus estudiantes de Global, que hay muchos de aquí, pero que también hay estudiantes de todas las nacionalidades, que una de, de las cosas que hace cada año es llevarlos a las dos fronteras, la de con Mar con Marruecos y la frontera con Francia. Eh, y también estábamos hablando pero de diferentes viajes y estancias que Matthew hizo para poder escribir sus libros. No sé si queréis decir algo en relación de esta experiencia para el final y también eh, para acabar una perspectiva, una visión respecto al futuro uh -huh. y este tema. ¿No? Uh -huh. El tema del cambio climático, el tema de, bueno, una cosa para, como para la última intervención en forma de, de estas dos preguntas. Uh -huh. um, I guess that kind of touches on a point I raised earlier, which is that th this century, the 21st century, is going to be a century dominated by migration. Not only by migration, but by forced migration. Already we're seeing the kind of increase in so-called climate refugees. As climate change begins to bite, and we're going to see vast movements of people. Um, so the decision we will have to make over the next century, are we going to respond the way and the, journal, the writer Christian Parenti, he wants to use the phrase, the politics of the armed lifeboat. I think it was a great phrase because the idea is, are our countries going to be like lifeboats in which we have people on the edge of the lifeboats with guns stopping people getting into the lifeboat? Or are we going to find a different kind of more collective concept of global security based on cooperation and real integration? And to me, that will decide, that question will decide in the end whether we continue to be democracies, whether we continue to be countries that take the concept of human rights seriously. If we don't do that, if we can't do that, we will go down the route that people like Salvini would like us to go down, which is basically a route towards fascism, in my opinion. Well, I thought that well, we've been thinking about this the whole day, but actually borders in the old times, when we were talking in the 19th century or even in the early 20th century, were the peripheries Absolutely. of the reality. Today, borders are the center of globalization. So it's the areas where everything is happening. Yeah. So we have to take very good care to know what's going on in those places because it's where the new stuff is happening. So I think that's the shifting in this thing. 
the climate change will create a lot of flow, but it's, for me, it's not very clear it's going to be in, in south going north or north going uh, or east, west. It's a still very clear how it's going to be the effects. So that's, that's still unquestionable. Maybe we'll get people from rich countries getting into the poor countries to colonize because in the rich country cannot leave. So we don't know what's going to happen. Um, thank you very much. Muchas gracias. Muchísimas gracias a tothom. La semana que ve continuarem parlant del tema dels refugiats amb la Marsa B de Open Arms i amb la professora de, de Dret d'aquesta universitat, Silvia Morgades. Així eh, esperem que podeu també estar aquí per continuar aquests diàlegs. I també vull anunciar que relacionat amb el tema de fronteres, de drets humans, de la justícia social i del tema dels refugiats, uh, tindrem com un diàleg fílmic el dia 26 de febrer a la BCM UPF a la, al carrer Balmes anunciarem i enviarem un mail a tothom que es veurà la pel·lícula Sal de la Tierra de Wim Wenders uh, relacionada amb la figura de Sebastió Salgado que és un, una altra de les figures que ha lluitat perquè el món sigui més just a través de la seva feina, etc. Així que també ho anuncio perquè està particularment relacionat amb els temes de diàleg d'avui, de la propera setmana i també del, del benestar del planeta, del canvi climàtic, que també intentem d'alguna manera introduir en els temes que, que parlem. Doncs moltíssimes gràcies a Matiu, que ha vingut de, de Regne Unit. Uh, per estar avui amb nosaltres, al professor Toni Luna i amb tots uh, vosaltres. Moltes gràcies i bona nit. Gràcies.